Well, thank you for uh, for having me here down in Texas. We appreciate the, the invite. And we'll go through uh, how we do some of our projects on various scales. Some are very small, some are very large. In Pennsylvania, we have Division of Habitat Management. We have Division of Fisheries Management. We actually have dedicated habitat staff and uh, within my section, I'm Lake Habitat Section Chief, I have two full-time habitat managers and we also get a, a seasonal every year and uh, three trucks and four boats and we travel all over the state of Pennsylvania. Since 1988, that's when we did our very first porcupine crib, started doing structures back then and since then we've reached over 110 different reservoirs, lakes in Pennsylvania and typically in one year we'll, we'll get to projects at 40 different uh, reservoirs every every year in PA. Cover the whole state and do quite a bit of travel. What we call our program in Pennsylvania, if you're a bass club or a park manager that's interested in doing some type of project at your local lake, is the Cooperative Habitat Improvement Program. So it's, we call it CHIP for short. And uh, within this program, you fill out an application. It's an easy two-pager, and it's more or less an agreement that you're going to start into a three to five year project with us, you know, you're going to be our local habitat partner. I'm going to look to you for certain resources locally. You can count on us for a number of different things that you see here on this list. So as a cooperator with our Fish and Boat Commission program, what we'll give you is technical guidance. So we'll start out and we'll look at your lakes. So some lakes, we have a lot of put and take trout lakes that don't necessarily get warm enough and uh, don't necessarily have the water quality to support a real good warm water fishery. If you're one of those lakes, I'm probably not going to put you on the priority list. So we're looking, we're looking for lakes where we're really going to get a lot of good response from panfish, largemouth. We'll get you, get you on the list there if you have those warm water fisheries. And so what we'll do is we'll actually come out to the lake typically with our Boston Whaler. We have a Lawrence HDS with structure scan. We're going to take a look at what the lake looks like. We already know going in that you got lots of veg and lots of stumps and rock. There's a good chance we're not going to come to your lake either. There's not much room for improvement as far as physical habitat. Uh, we may not come out either. We heard Jeff's uh, talk earlier. A lot of these reservoirs are aging. The habitat was phenomenal many years ago, but over, over time it slowly breaks down and through drawdowns especially, a lot of our lake bottoms are pretty darn barren. You're looking at aquatic deserts out there. So we'll look at that lake bottom and uh, we'll design a, a habitat layout and you'll see a, a plan map on here a little bit later. Um, but part of our program, so we'll go out there, we'll do a plan, we'll actually help you get the, the permits. You know, the permit will be in the cooperator's name. Through our program you can also get up to $3,000, Fish and Boat Commission dollars, through our program on a 50-50 match. So a typical example I'll use, let's say a porcupine crib project, you know, maybe Fish and Boat Commission will buy the wood and our cooperators will buy the block and some other materials and then your man hours to count towards your map. So all your all your volunteers, let's say the whole bass club comes out, you know, we can count all those hours towards towards your match of that, that three thousand dollars. And Fish and Boat Commission I mentioned we have boats and in a large scale project we also have our own Fish and Boat Commission construction crew. Uh, not necessarily designated specifically for habitat. They usually do accesses, boat ramps, hatchery work. But I can get those guys booked up for a week or two, you know, here and there. We can do a real big project. Like I said, two different approaches. I like to call this volunteer scale, not necessarily a small scale, because in some cases we do, you know, over 100 structures, sometimes 300 structures. You know, we, we can go pretty big with, with these types of projects. A typical day when I, when I pull up, there's volunteers there. So that's our cooperator's job is not necessarily just bass guys, but Boy Scout groups, watershed groups, and they'll be waiting for us there at the launch with materials. So I'll come in in the white truck and the boat and bring all of our equipment and safety gear, and we'll do a talk. We'll do a talk, and a lot of kids like to, to learn about what they're building. The kids absolutely love building some of these porcupine cribs, and, and then they get to go for a boat ride. Many of them have never been in a boat before and get to go out and put these things out. In some cases, when you're working with middle school age kids, we're not going to get the nail guns out. That's a bad idea. <laughs> but we do get out hammers and nails. We, we don't do these projects too often, but every once in a while there's a couple of schools that will give me a call and say, hey, we want to we wanna do these types of projects. And, and the kids just love it. We did one uh, about three weeks ago, and some of the kids, it was just one of the stations at their environmental day, and they don't want to leave. They want to keep running the running the hammer. You know, they they really get into it. So it's a lot of fun. And like I said, they get out there and get to.
to put uh, what they built into the lake. So we have several different structure types. Up here top left is what we call a short vertical plank structure. The original idea there when, when these were first built was you know, just taking pallets and building those vertical. Porky plank rib is kind of like the bread and butter of our volunteer scale projects. Uh, it's a deep water brush, brush structure. Top right is a turtle basking platform. Uh, bottom left is a uh, black bass nesting structure. These structures do pretty well as far as largemouth and smallmouth you know, spawning adjacent to these things. Over the years, what I've learned is you can't put them in drawdown reservoirs though. They're going to get exposed to that wave action, that, that top will peel right off. So, But they do, they last a very, very long time in full pool. Bottom center was designed for a shallow water reservoir. So you can put these things in five foot of water, it's Porcupine Crib Junior. So just a shortened version of the of the senior, and then bottom right I'll cover in just a little bit is a, uh, a channel catfish spawning box. The the shorties that you saw on the top left there, uh, we've been going to these a little bit more uh, recently. We can get them prefab. You see the the tractor trailer load there. We can fit 80 of these on a on a drop deck trailer. We've gotten plenty of U.S. Army Corps of Engineer money and grant money to do a pile of these in a, in a short period of time. You can run a forklift under the ceiling boards of these, load them right on the boat. And as you can see in the bottom right too, it's a good way to, to distribute your brush out there real easy. You can have volunteers stuff, the, stuff them full of brush, make some nice complex woody cover. And these are our most durable volunteer scale structure. We've had these in, in drawdown reservoirs. They're very, very tough. Uh, I've seen this structure with 10 inches of ice on top. You know, ice coming straight down and they're just, they're just built that solid that they can, they can last a long time. In Sayers, which gets drawn down every year there in Center County where I live, we've had some last 12, 15 years and that gets drawn down every year. So every year you have that thing getting exposed to wave action, uh, sometimes ice, you know, and they're, they're pretty darn durable and they hold a lot of fish too. So this is some pre and post monitoring with treatment and control, those short vertical plank structures. Fisheries world, we like to have a lot of data, but uh, in this case, it wasn't really an option. Sometimes grants don't go for 10 years at a time, but in this case, just pre and post, uh, and, you know, a lot of the folks in this room know that they work pretty well, you know, putting brush and, and uh, wood structure in there. Pretty much had the effect that we, we expected to, the, the treatment site went up, control went down, and a lot of these bats were were legal size as well. So you can see 12 inches or greater is what they are for legal size in Pennsylvania. Uh, 15 inches or larger is what we consider big bass in, in Pennsylvania. So they did they did very well you know, from 2009 to 2010. And I've shocked them on a number of other reservoirs and they do, they do really well, especially for largemouth and bluegill. My favorite structure is a uh, felled shoreline tree. You know, some folks like to hinge cut them We'll cut them and actually cable right to the to the stump. We'll cable that tree and large amount of habitat in a short period of time. And everybody loves fishing trees. I mean, you can see them. You can pull the boat right up to them. And then we also have Bubba. This is a, a customized rock rubble barge. We got a one ton hopper on it. You can do about 40 tons of stone a day. When we're talking small budget, you can make a pretty good site with 40 tons of stone. You can make a pretty good number of rock rubble humps. Let's say if you're working around a fishing pier, uh, you know, some sort of uh, shoreline fishing site, you know, you can really load it up with, with stone with this small boat. In some cases, like this year, we had an Army Corps of Engineers had over 2,000 tons of, of stone. Well, that's uh, quite a big job for this little boat. And so you'll see in, in Shane's presentation here in a little bit, there's a barge. Uh, Weaver Zinc out of Iowa owns this barge. And uh, we loaded that thing up and placed over 2,000 tons of stone. And, uh, a little less than two weeks, you know, so there are there are machines out there capable of doing uh, large amounts of material. Large scale, and this kind of came about in 2008, you know, our administration is, is, you know, kind of pushing us to go towards much larger, you know, looking at whole lake renovation sort of stuff. And in some cases we do sediment, you know, we do sediment removal or not necessarily Fish and Boat Commission, but, uh, you know, a contracted group will come in and do sediment removal as well. But we'll also, you know, as, as habitat managers, we'll be looking for, you know, what all can we add while this lake's down. In some cases, the, the lake can't be drawn down, but in most cases, they can. 
and uh, we're not talking a full drawdown. We don't want to kill all the fish or anything like that, but you can run the machines right on the lake bottom, you know, lots of materials, doing uh, rock rubble piles and, and some other stuff that we'll show you here in a minute. So this is what we consider a post cluster. And what we were looking for here is something that's going to mim mimic uh, standing timber. As anglers, I don't know too many guys that don't like fishing standing timber. And so we wanted to mimic some sort of vertical cover and we incorporated rock rubble piles and uh, as well as some, some horizontal cover. And this, this spot in the bottom right is pretty phenomenal, both for largemouth and black crappie at, at, at Sayers. You can take the kids right there and have them cast into those posts and, and pick up a lot, of, a lot of crappie in the springtime. Here's a pre and post. Uh, this is Sayers. This is the one that's kind of in our backyard. Uh, gets drawn down every year. Obviously, the left picture, there's, there's no cover at all. And uh, you can see on the right picture there, we did incorporate some of that horizontal cover. And diving, well not diving, but snorkeling on some of these structures, a lot of smaller bass seem to be in and around a lot of that horizontal cover. We have two designs that uh, some other folks put together here. Top right with what we call a spider hump. You know, somebody getting pretty creative here. Anytime you look at our structures, it's usually wood and rock. You know, we try to put, put those two types of materials together as best we can. And uh, bottom right is uh, a rock star, and we've done really well electrofishing these, uh, both for black bass, smallmouth, and largemouth, and uh, and black crappie. Uh, you hit some of those boards with the electrofisher, and they just they just roll up out of there. Uh, one other observation, and this is there at Sayers in Pennsylvania, but what we've noticed on some of these flats that don't have a lot of vegetation, in some way, shape, or form, these whether it's the limestone or the, the stone warming up in the springtime, but the vegetation around these piles has just shot up. And this is a, a drawn down reservoir that gets frozen out every year, you know, so vegetation's at a minimum. But uh, for whatever reason, you know, there's something either chemical or physical going on there where the vegetation has done really well. Uh, this is pre and post at Hammond Lake. You can see our, our spider humps there, some rock stars. And this is, uh, this is becoming more and more requested in Pennsylvania. You heard you know, both Iowa and Nebraska talk about shoreline stabilization, very, very important for uh, water quality. And you know, us as habitat managers, not only we're we looking at water quality, but we want to put some sort of physical habitat in there too. And uh, so we're, we try to get those nasty, ugly root wads, keep a stem on them so that we can tie them right into the bank. And each, each shoreline is different. Sometimes you may not have the depth to get that whole thing in there, um, but you may, you may be able to find a, a smaller root wad. But we'll, we'll put that root wad and trench it into the bank, and then we'll build what we call our deflectors. We, we frame these structures up with uh, some real big rock, frame them in the shape of a triangle, dissipate that, that wave energy that's coming in, and then backfill with, with some smaller stones, some fours and fives. Just a, a pre and post picture of a, a, a typical shoreline. A lot of these are in our state parks and, and uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers parks. And we do put emphasis on riparian buffers. It can be controversial with park users. Kids don't want their, or I should say parents don't always want their kids wading through a bunch of brush or grass because of ticks and snakes and that sort of thing. So we try to compromise in some cases, try to talk them back from mowing a lot and uh, maybe just mowing a path down to some of these structures and leaving some of, the, some of your riparian buffer, your grass and your, your shrub area grow up. That'll help filter some of your water you know, before it gets to the shoreline. So here's, here's a pretty good pre and post picture. This is one that I'm actually doing an angler survey on. Both pictures were actually taken by a trail camera that I have mounted up in the tree. So what I wanted to do here is actually count the number of anglers pre and post that are using this shoreline as far as fishing. Sometimes the, the pictures are a little blurry too, but I, what I wanted to do here too is see if I could count numbers of fish being caught. Pictures pretty much say it all. You have a, a pretty eroded bank there. The picture on the left is on a rainy day. You can see how much sediment comes off even when the waves aren't crashing. Sometimes just the runoff from the shoreline really puts a lot of sediment in the water. And then what we do is we grade it back to a three to one. We build those triangles. The, the lake's up a little bit in that, that picture on the right, so you don't really see the frame rock there. But what those triangles do, those deflectors, and they put a real nice spot for, for the family to go out and set up, you know, set up and fish off of. 
We have pre and post data on this one as well. The shoreline that you're looking at there, we went from having five bluegills you know, the first year to 110 bluegills the, the second year. Went from having zero bass to nine bass, you know, and we're looking at a 200 foot stretch, so we're not talking about a lot of shoreline there. And so here's our habitat plan map. So, so Jeff said about our Fish and Boat Commission website on the bottom. There's lots of resources there. We got video and, and PowerPoints, and we, we even show you uh, exactly how to build our structures. You know, it gives you the, the materials and standard drawings on how to build them. Uh, but what every angler wants is what you're looking at right here. Where are my fishing license dollars going? Well, this is going to spell that out for you. So you can put it right in the GPS and go, go right to your spot. Not only is this a, an angler map, but this is my plan map. So when I'm standing there on, on the, the day of the project, I'm looking at this is where we're going to work this year. Moving forward, the way we kind of look at things is, you know, we'll try to do both volunteer scale and large scale. The funding is going to be there, and if the need is there, so you can establish some volunteer scale sites so you can work with your bass club or your boy scout group and then if the big money comes in you know also lay out some areas where you can work with heavy machinery and get a large large amount of material in a short period of time so project monitoring you know we have some folks that, that monitor you know numbers of reptiles as fish and boat commission we're in we're in charge of uh, reptiles and amphibians as well just documenting what type of species and how many turtles are used and we have some threatened species the red belly turtle on the top right that, that uh, uses the turtle platforms quite a bit. Electrofishing we've, we've covered and this is something fairly new for us that we started two years ago uh, and it's the channel catfish spawning box study and so for years we put some of these structures in we had a good feeling that the channel cats were spawning in them we weren't sure of any kind of success whether there was you know fry coming out of these boxes or what was going on we just knew in a hatchery setting you put a milk can in a in a pond the channel cats spawn in it and you can take the eggs out so we put this box together years ago put them in a couple of lakes and one of my staff said hey ben why don't we build a couple of these with you know, a ceiling board that comes open, we'll put a latch on it and we'll go out there and check them. And uh, so we put a dozen of these in that lake that's, that's right up the road. And what we found out is the channel cats really like them. And the channel cats spawn for a long period of time as well. Our, our biologist said uh, late June, July. We had them spawning from May 20th all the way to August 12th. And that, that, that June, July period was peak, but they spawned the, the whole time. Each box, out of that dozen had a spawn, at least one spawning event. Nine of them had two spawning events, others had three. This was actually Juniata College. They did another study for us this last year with a GoPro camera, and we wanted to compare boxes that were covered in rock compared to boxes that have brush nearby. And uh, what we found out is that you prefer the rock, and the, the boxes that have the brush get a lot more bluegills that come in there to eat the fry. So here's dad protecting the, the egg mass. And then these are some of the fry that are produced. And this all happens in just a, a couple of days, about four or five days uh, between when, when mom and dad do their thing and, and when, the, uh, when the fry come out. And dad sticks around typically in the box. Channel cats are really hard to noodle. <laughs> and they'll bite your finger pretty hard. Yeah, we've had a couple guys try to do that. It doesn't work out very well. And they, and they come out of there like a torpedo, too. And another way to, to, that's fun and, and easy to do is, is you know, taking your, your hummingbird or your Lowrance out there and actually finding the cribs and finding fish on them and hopefully, you know, fishing on them. Uh, we, have, we have a number of folks that, you know, kind of give us a hard time if we do a deep water site. We've got a lot of people that uh, say, well, you thermocline and that sort of thing. And that's the thermocline is, is true, you know, in a lot of our lakes in PA. But fish aren't always in the zero to 10 foot area. That doesn't stay that way all year round. And so we have a couple of deep water cribs and they hold a pile of fish. We talked about partners. I think we, we stressed that point pretty good. Reservoir Fish Habitat Partnership has, has worked out really well for us. Uh, we've done two large-scale fish habitat projects, one at Leaser Lake and, and Sayers, and uh, really made that money go, go a long ways. Lots and lots of large-scale habitat, and, uh, and you know, the anglers are really happy. We, we hear a lot of positive uh, feedback from those folks. And as you can see, you know, we have partners all across the board, many different walks of life. Some folks that have never fished before to bass anglers that have been fishing since they were five. It's a pretty diverse group. And with that, I'd, I'd like to end there.